Moving forward in the vlog, uh, I want to put right now the interview that I did with Azim from Right to Be Smoke Free. They are filing the big, big industry lawsuit against the FDA. I made a post about it on GrimGreen.com, which I'll be linking to down in the description. And Brian from Vapor Shark was nice enough to get me in contact with Azim. We had a quick chat over Skype. I recorded the whole thing. Great Great information. Azim is an incredibly smart guy. He is a lawyer. He's been working with the vape industry for years now, and he knows what's going on. So we are going to watch slash listen to this. Uh, it's about 20 minutes long. So right after that, um, I'm going to come back here. We're going to do a quick what I've been vaping, and then we're going to get on with the blog. Is the vlog as far as uh, beer shout outs, first impressions, blah, 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 blah. So let's go to that interview now. All right. Well, today we are going to do a quick interview with Azim, who is one of the lawyers on the right to be smoke free lawsuit that just got filed on Tuesday. I apologize if it looks weird or sounds weird. Uh, this is the first time I've ever tried to record and a Skype conversation. Um, he's giving me a call right now. Sure. Should we do video? Azim. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. How are you? Just uh, say a couple things. Let me get a sound check. Uh, this is Azim. I'm talking to the Grim Green. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That sounds that sounds great. So, uh, how are you? I don't think we've ever met. Have we ever met? I I don't know. I don't think I don't believe we have, unfortunately. Okay. Um, well, these but I've happen. heard a lot about you, and um, you know, I, mean, I know Brian from Vapor Shark's been trying to get us to connect for some time. So I'm glad it's finally happening. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, very cool. Well, I don't have anything uh, really official uh, planned. I was just going to ask you some questions, give you some time to you know, I don't know, talk and and explain kind of what's going on this kind of just happened on today it happened on tuesday uh, i got the email early this morning that the lawsuit had been filed so yep there's that it's a thing that's happening i guess first uh i guess just introduce yourself and say what you are and who you what you do so uh, a quick introduction my name is azim chowdhury i am a partner at the law firm of keller and heckman we are based in Washington, D.C., but we are a global firm with offices uh, in uh, Brussels, San Francisco, uh, and Shanghai. Mm -hmm. uh, we focus on regulatory law and providing guidance on companies who are trying to market products around the world, uh, particularly FDA-regulated products. And that's my area of expertise is food and drug law, FDA law. And within that, I have been uh, working with the vapor industry for many years, almost since the very beginning, since probably 2009, 2010, researching and writing articles about how vapor products, including e-liquids and devices, might one day be regulated by FDA, mm -hmm. which we now know with the passage of the final deeming rule is going to be what um, is, is, we now now know how FDA is going to regulate these products, which is effectively going to, uh, in our opinion, unfortunately, result in a ban of most products. Yeah, that's yeah, that's huge. So you've been working with the vapor industry for a while now. Um, I, were you working on uh, Indiana as well? Yes. So last year, when the Indiana legislator passed their, their law regulating how e-liquids can be manufactured in that state, we started getting calls from a number of our clients about how to comply um, because most of the industry does want to work with uh, the authorities and does want to comply with the reasonable regulations. Sure. And so as we started doing more research into what it takes to comply with Indiana, we, we started discovering how first difficult it was and then realized how practically impossible it was to comply with, with the Indiana requirements, particularly these um, security requirements, which require that you, if you're, if you want to produce e-liquid and sell it in Indiana, you have to uh, have a security, a third-party security firm that has certain certifications in place uh, by a certain date, which has passed. 
um, in order to to get a permit to manufacture e-liquid. Um, no matter where you are in the country, even if you're located in Florida or California or wherever else, you have to work, you know, with someone that that meets these requirements, and um, uh, you know, to to get a permit in Indiana. And so ultimately, we discovered that this was um, really just an effort to protect the economic interests of one company in Indiana, who happens to be a security company that meets requirements. And we filed a lawsuit on behalf of a coalition that came together of e-liquid companies um, challenging that law. And the purpose of the coalition wasn't just for Indiana. Um, it was to fill what we saw as the gap in terms of, you know, we have a lot of good, you know, great, hardworking advocacy groups that are lobbying and, and uh, working on the ground to prevent laws like this from passing. Mm -hmm. But we realized that w w what happens when the law that you're against passes, or if you feel that it's unconstitutional or treating your products unfairly, what do you do then if there's no effective advocacy measures left? Well, in our opinion, you got to go to court. You got to be prepared to file a lawsuit, particularly in the cases um, that we believe are unconstitutional, mm -hmm. and challenge these laws in in the court of law. And, and that's what we ultimately did with Indiana on behalf of the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition. Mm -hmm. And we are actually in the last, you know, that we're about less than 10 days away from that uh, law in Indiana from becoming effective. Um, and we're hoping to um, get a decision from the judge on our injunction um, and po potentially our motion for summary judgment in the next few days. So um, keep your ears close to the ground. Uh, we, we should be hopefully hearing something one or the other very soon. Um, and, you know, regardless, the fight will go on there as well. So, um, yeah. but without babbling too far uh, or too long, um, I, I mentioned Indiana. Um, the other big thing that we're handling right now is a lawsuit that we filed yesterday on behalf of the coalition, uh, as well as a, a number of eBay for Trade Associations, uh, challenging FDA's implementation of the Tobacco Control Act and the deeming regulation. And so that was literally just filed yesterday on the 20th of June, and um, we're just starting that process, but uh, I'm happy to talk about that, about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't know a lot about, well, I know close to little about uh, lawyering and litigation and injunctions and this, that, and the other. Um, so what, what exactly was filed and it, it's going to be, I'm assuming it's going to be a long process. Is this something that's going to take a long time to, to see the court? Is it ever going to see the court? What happens there? Sure, that's a great question. Um, timing, it, it, this could be a situation where things get um, prolonged for a couple of years. Depending on how things proceed, there could be appeals if we decide to move for a preliminary injunction, a decision on that type of issue uh, would likely get appealed. Um, so there, there are a number of, of hurdles and procedures in place that it, right now it's hard to say how, how quickly this will proceed. Um, although I will say that you know an effort has been made here in the DC circuit to expedite things um, uh, so that we, we, we are not in a state of limbo for forever. So what I mean by that is what we have done is we filed a lawsuit, which is a complaint, mm -hmm. um, which is the document that, I'm, that has, I think has been making the rounds on social media today. Yeah. But that is essentially, you know, our statement of the case, um, us arguing what what we think FDA got wrong and and what they violated in terms of their duties, um, uh, and by violations of various aspects of the Tobacco Control Act itself and the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, for example, as well as the Constitution. So we put that out there. That's our complaint. That's that setting, uh, you know, that is the starting point of any lawsuit. Um, FDA will have an opportunity to respond. We will work with them and the court to enter into a what's called a scheduling order to figure out the timeline for when we would uh, have to file any sort of uh, motions for injunction or motion for summary judgment. Um, we would schedule the oral arguments, which is a hearing for some time later this year. And so all those things are going to come together once we get a chance to meet with the industry, excuse me, meet with the FDA and, and the courts 
and the judge who's assigned to our case, um, uh, and we'll figure out a path forward, which will be, um, which will really decide how 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 long this goes on. Okay, well, that sounds good. Um, one thing that I noticed in in reading through all of this stuff that Brian sent me is it seems to be a lot of different um, bullet points as far as you know, like you said, complaints. Um, is this uh, a calculated thing or is it throwing a lot out there and, and seeing what sticks? Well, we certainly believe that all the points that we've made, all the different counts, I think there's total of eight are all valid mm -hmm. um, and all you know are, are points that we think the FDA or the court should, should rule on. Um, and so uh, a lot of thought has gone into this, a lot of strategy, a lot of discussion, a lot of research. Um, we have been working on this, um, just so you know, well before the rule was published mm -hmm. um, in May. Uh, we, we had started working on this case uh, a few months uh, prior when it, it became more clear that the rule was likely to be published a, a, you know, imminently. Um, so probably back in you know March or February, we started, uh, on behalf of the coalition, they asked us to, to start looking into these issues that we would be prepared to do something quickly. Um, and so we've put a lot of thought into the causes of action that we've brought here. And um, if you've seen the actual lawsuit itself, uh, the actual complaints, it's a 37-page document, which which sets the stage by you know, discussing um, how, where we are and how we got here. Mm -hmm. And and then it jumps into the actual causes of action, which you probably saw, you know, bullet pointed as, as a summary of, of the complaint. Mm -hmm. So... Certainly, you know, we'll, we'll decide as we move forward on which potential causes, which counts are, are stronger ones and which are maybe weaker, um, not to say that any of them are weak, right. but um, we'll decide on which ones uh, as a strategy make the most sense to move on summary judgment for, which ones we might want to hold off until later, etc. So um right now there's a lot of stuff in there and you know we'll, we'll work with our clients and and our lawyers um the, the the litigation team to decide um the next best steps but right now that's what we're bringing okay excellent and and it's a lot of stuff and uh, i'm not sure i'm sure you're aware of there, there are other lawsuits happening yeah. um right with, within the industry at least within my group of people uh we've been talking about the quote-unquote big lawsuit and and this is the the big sort of coalition lawsuit are, are the other lawsuits going to uh, affect this one there's one that, that lost art liquids did there's, there's right. one that the la uh, some lab i can't remember the name of they filed a lawsuit as well how do those affect this lawsuit yeah that's a great question um first let me just say we you know we support all the efforts here and um We've been in communication with the other attorneys who are representing those uh, companies who have filed individual lawsuits. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, Lost Art filed a lawsuit in California in the Ninth Circuit. Um, that's that's where they're located, so that, that makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've alleged a lot of similar issues and things here uh, as we have, as has um, Nicopure, which is also yes. known as Halo, as I understand it. Um, they filed actually the first lawsuit um, here in D.C. as well on May 10th, um, also alleging similar violations of FDA, um, violations of the APA and, and other, other laws. Uh, I understand there's also been a lawsuit filed in West Virginia by one of the state delegates there um, in his personal capacity as, I believe, a consumer. Yes. Um, so that's happened as well. That's also That lawsuit is also very similar to the Nick Appear one. And so... And, uh, and there's also been lawsuits filed by the cigar industry. A, a, a cigar company has filed it on behalf of, this, of, uh, of themselves. Um, and there's also, uh, I believe, Altria filed a lawsuit um, specifically on the issue of being able to, to make a modified risk statement for their black and mild uh, products. Um, so those are sort of you know, separate from the vapor industry. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you know, I think with the right to be smoke free lawsuit, I think we're at six total lawsuits, five or six total lawsuits. So, um, but you're right. I think our, our position with our lawsuit is that we wanted this one to be the industry lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted this one to to have the voice of the industry, um, to be a little bit more detailed and specific 
to, for the industry's concerns um, than some of the other ones that have been, been filed. Um, because we do, you know, this isn't just a situation. We want the court to understand. This is not just a situation where it's just one or two companies who are fighting for their individual rights. This is a, a, this is a regulation that will impact thousands of companies, even more jobs uh, and people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the point of this lawsuit is to have that impact. So that's, why, that's why we have, I think, 11 different associations listed on our complaint mm-hmm. as plaintiffs in addition to the several others who are contributing financially towards this effort, mm-hmm. um, including um, Safada, Casa, Sevilla, USA, um, uh, and Not Blowing Smoke. Um, so, yeah, you're right. This is meant to be the industry lawsuit. This is meant to be the one that um, shows the court that it's not just one or two companies fighting this, but really, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of companies across the country. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, um, you, this is something that you may or may not be able to talk about. Uh, how, uh, how optimistic are you that we can enact real change, uh, moving forward and actually change the law? Well, any, any litigation of the nature is going to be very difficult to win and that, but people need to understand that. Yeah. Um, this is an uphill battle. We are challenging um, a federal agency that has made decisions based on what they believe to be the science. And a court and a judge is not going to necessarily jump in and, and tell the FDA, which is supposed to be the scientific expert, on what the science says or how they should regulate these products based on the available research and evidence. Um, but what we do want to attack is is the process that FDA took to reaching its decisions. And that's where there's some meat on the bones here, in mm-hmm. our opinion. Um, that's where we can say, look, throughout the complaint, we, we highlight instances where the FDA, in its preamble to the deeming reg, um, made admissions about the PMTA process and the availability of long-term data, for example, that would be necessary to complete pre-market tobacco application. And despite those admissions, they still require, you know, companies to submit PMTAs uh, within two years. Mm -hmm. And so that's a a process that we don't think FDA adequately considered. Um, They didn't adequately consider the comments. There are many thousands of comments that were submitted and made a part of the administrative record during the whole comment period back a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And FDA, for the most part, essentially ignored that ignored those comments without providing any rationale as they're required to do under the Administrative Procedures Act. And so those are things that we believe should, could and should be attacked and that the courts will look at and say, well, well, how is FDA coming to this conclusion? You know, when they admit in a number of places, as again, as cited in our complaint, mm-hmm. about the health risk of e-cigarettes compared to tobacco cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they admit that there's a continuum of risk of tobacco, of harm for tobacco products, mm-hmm. and that e-cigarettes are less harmful. And nevertheless, they still implemented this one-size-fits-all um, regime that treats vapor products just like cigarettes. Um, and so that doesn't quite, that doesn't make sense. They didn't justify that in our opinion. They didn't provide the rationale for that. And that's what a court's going to look at and say, what's going on here? This doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, and there's even a quote, I believe, from Mitch Zeller himself talking about the the possible health benefits uh, of e-cigarettes, saying that if all smokers switched over to e-cigarettes, that would be a good thing for public health. Exactly. I mean, these are things, exactly. that, these are things that he's said. Uh, anyway, well, it, it, this has gone a little long, but obviously, thank you for talking to me. Um, if there's anything else that you want to throw out there for my viewers... Um, that would be cool. If not, sure, then, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, the only thing I'll throw out there is you know, um, uh, take a look at the Right to Be Smoke Free's webpage. That's www. r the number two the letter b smokefree. org. Mm-hmm. Um, it's being updated as we speak, so there'll be more information on um, uh, on our case as we proceed. You'll see who's who's been able to donate and contribute to the cause. Um, 
So companies out there, you, you know, you're we're welcome to to join and contribute to the to the effort, mm -hmm. as as well as individuals that are interested in contributing. There's a link on the webpage to do that. So um, I just encourage you to to um, uh, pay attention to that and, and spread the word. Yeah, absolutely. Um, stay informed, and I mean, I'm assuming a lawsuit of this size is it's not free, it's not cheap, uh, it's gonna cost money. Um, I've donated money, I think everybody, no matter the amount, uh, should definitely donate money. There's a lot of people who are chomping at the bit to do something, you know, how do I get involved, how do I help, how do I do this, we should have a protest, here, sign my petition, and really donating money to this lawsuit, no matter the amount, uh, I think would, would be helpful, definitely. I agree. So, uh, yeah, Azim, awesome. uh, really good to talk to you. Uh, thank you for talking to me. We've already been talking for 20 minutes uh, or so, believe it or not, which is crazy. Wow. Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll have links down in the description of the video. And uh, thank you, uh, Azim, again for, for joining me. Um, you are more than welcome to contact me at any time if you ever have any information or anything that you want to get out to my audience on youtube which is the best audience on youtube really if i mean if when it gets down to it but uh yeah I, absolutely thank you azim thank you for having me so yeah a lot of really great information there from azim uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to make that video the interview its own video and i'm going to upload that tomorrow on friday just so that it's something that's easier to share around it, uh, the, I want to include it in the vlog because people watch the vlog. And so I wanted this to be the first time that that gets aired. And then I want to make it its own separate video so that it's easily shareable, if that makes any sense. So you don't have to send someone the vlog and go, oh, timestamp, go to this number on the timestamp and then watch the interview. And then there's like, you know, 45 minutes of video after that and like 15 minutes of video before it. What I want to do is I want to cut that part out. I want to feature just that part. I want to highlight just that interview in its own video so that it's easy to share around and share with people and, you know, around the community cool cool so that's uh, that's that that was my interview with Azim um, what I'm gonna do now is talk about what I have been vaping and there has been a lot of it like I said before